and we're here with Connor Ryan. Connor, what is up? What's going on, Evan? How you doing? Good. I feel like all of us on the Bruins beat, not this podcast, but the actual job of Bruins beat uh, are just so, there's been so much and there's a good chance this just continues going. And we were saying before we started recording that as much work as it's been, it's kind of nice having this all back. I'll take this over, you know, spending like May doing like, you know, mock Seattle expansion drafts or like breaking down the cap and how miserable it's going to be the next couple of years with that stuff. So I will take even how kind of bootleg this new schedule is for the Bruins and Lightning going forward. I'll take that over, you know, what we've been doing for months on end leading up to this. Yeah. I mean, for me with this podcast, I'll take it with written. I'll take it with video. I mean, for you at BSJ, which is great. You guys should go subscribe. You guys, you have to do that every day. That, that, you know, you have to find something to write every day. And doing that in the midst of a pandemic with nothing going on, I always felt for you and for all the people who had to have something out every single day because uh, there was barely any content for a, a one piece a week back in, you know, those dog days of May and early June. Oh, the, th- the thought of it makes my head hurt. But we have hockey, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, the Bruins... We're recording this uh, Monday afternoon. Bruins up one nothing in the series uh, after a 3-2 win in game one. Now, there is one storyline, I think, in this series that gained some traction this ap- Monday afternoon. Uh, you're hearing this Tuesday morning or whenever you listen to it this week. Uh, Yaroslav Halak playing, played phenomenal in game one. The two shots that he let in were a little iffy, but one went off McAvoy. The other had eyes, as Cassidy said. So be it. Um, but Halak is still a backup goalie. And might be prone to some little issues here and there, like we saw in game four in, against the Hurricanes. Connor, I want to ask you, do you trust Halak for the rest of this series? I mean, I think if you're ruined, you're going to have to. And I think, honestly, if you look at his play, I mean, other than that, you know, I think it was game four against Carolina where he had those, you know, a couple of those softies where you looked at them and right away, even before, you know, you took – I look at the replays and saw if there's any deflections. Like, those were some softies he let up in that, that game four against Carolina. The ones yesterday, I mean, the only guy who seemed to who could score against Tulloch was Charlie McAvoy. The poor guy was, like, in front, gets deflections or screens both times and a bit of a bad break there. But I think as a whole, you have to be impressed with what Halak has given you. Like, are you a better team when you have both Tuka Rask and Yaroslav Halak both there? Yeah, of course. And especially when you look at what this kid is going to be going forward and the kind of the amount of, work you're gonna have to put a lot through to kind of get through Tampa and then whoever you play next if you get to the next round and so forth so it's going to be a challenge but I think you look at what he's given you so far he's done a pretty good job in terms of tracking the puck he's done good with you know it seems like all the the goals he's let up it's from you know uh, you know low to high plays or just shots from the point a lot of these like a team like Tampa you know they're not really like Carolina where they they do a lot of low to high there are a lot of Getting the puck down low, you know, that third line catches in a lot on, you know, good forechecking. Braden Point, I don't think that guy has ever scored a goal, like, outside of 20 feet of the net. That guy just always is in, like, that grade A ice. So, that's where Tampa's at its best. And that's where Halak so far in this postseason has shown that he's been pretty good there. So, I mean, I think you can definitely win with Halak. It's just, when you look at the schedule, it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of approach it going forward in this series. So, that's exactly it, what you said. You have no choice but to trust Yaroslav Halak. You can't not trust Yaroslav Halak. I mean, again, we're looking at there's really no backup options to Yaroslav Halak. I know there's Ladar. I know there's Lega- uh, like Legacy. Legacy, I think it is. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, but, you know, Vladar's never played an NHL game. Legacy's a, you know, hasn't had much experience either. And so you, now you might have two back-to-backs in this series. Now, Cassidy spoke about this Monday afternoon and said they'd make a decision Wednesday morning after game two, what what they would do with the net for game three. You can't start Vladar. You can't. I'm sorry. Against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And we'll get to this later. This is the Eastern Conference Final. This is the ECF. And starting your third string goalie against that Tampa team is not the right move, in my not-so-humble opinion. No, I mean, I totally agree with you. Again, it's, you know, he's, he's technically the backup, and it's not like an, an indictment on Dan Vladar and, like, the season he had down in Providence. Well, like, I mean, come on now. You're going up against a team and a core that, you know, last year put together one of the best uh, runs for a team ever in the salary cap era and can almost, you know, was still a very, very good team this year. They are right behind the Bruins in the standings. Like, this this team is stacked, and they can beat in a lot of the way, a lot of ways. So, 
you're going to roll out Dan Vladar, who, as you said, has never played one game up here. And it, with the stage that, that he's in, you know, in a game that could be a pivotal game three, I mean, let's say Tampa counters back, which we expect them to, and they win game two, you're going to turn to Dan Vladar to be the guy that shifts the momentum of a series like it. Again, it's a thing where you look at it as like a scenario and like, you know, they could turn to him. Maybe I, I highly doubt it though. Because again, you just look at the, what's at stake, the circumstances. I just remember like, I forget what year it was, but it's when they were trying to like get Malcolm Subban up. And I think someone was injured and they brought him up for a game and it was just one to see oh. how he did. And I forget who they played, but I mean. The Blues. Yeah, yeah, they played him in St. Louis. He got shellacked. Yeah, and it was just like right away, you're just like, oh, God, this poor guy. And like, that's the last thing you want to do for a guy like Vladar, too. It's like first game here. Have fun, you know, stopping the Tampa Bay Lightning. Like a team like that, you know, with the stakes that they're in. So, I, I, you know, he's technically the backup, but I think you just have to roll with Halak for the rest of this postseason. I think that just gives you the best chance. And it's just not fair for a guy like Vladar to be put in a spot like that. Again, Let's see what happens in game two if if Halak pulls a Jordan Bennington and is just complete, you know, trash for the entire game or gets up, you know, four goals in the first period, then you might have to be like, oh, all right, well, we have to take a deeper look at it. But I still just don't think it's viable to have Vladar as your go-to guy there. How about Bennington? I mean, that was horrendously terrible in that in that first round series. I mean, he's like why they lost pretty much. Now, again, I didn't see every game they played, a lot of their games we right after Bruins and we were both working during then, but holy crap, where the hell was that in game seven last year? Exactly. Well, you know, it's, it's tough when, you know, you're letting up like goals like that to, you know, Vancouver's, you know, extremely talented fourth line with guys like Jay Beagle and Roussel and those guys, the ones who were potting goals past you. So again, yeah, I, I looked at that performance and it's like, I just don't see how that, how what happened last day happened, especially in that game seven where, but again, also the Bruins in that game seven, I mean, we, we've talked about this many times, but you know, after, after they get away, yeah, a few of those quality looks in the first period. I mean, like Joe Keem Nordstrom was like their best forward in that game seven. You're not going to win a lot of game sevens with, you know, your, your fourth line winger being your best forward out there. So it's Hey, like, he hustles. Joe Keem hustles. Yeah, I mean, Hey, he's having a great postseason, but again, in terms of, you know, having a recipe for success, your fourth line winger should not be your best forward in a, uh, a do or die uh, cup on the line. My favorite was, uh, it was in the Hurricane series, I think. Uh, Joakim Nordstrom had like a partial breakaway on the shorthand, I think. I forget what game it was. And he got the puck and immediately threw it and it missed the net. But like, it was just, he, you could tell he was never expecting to be in a breakaway situation. And he was like, holy shit, what the fuck do I do? <laughs> he just chucks it over the net. I thought that was great. Um, but so back to this Halak thing. By the way, Vladar signed middle of uh, game one. I thought that yeah, was one I, of the weirdest I, I, lit time things ever. I, I can't think the last time I've seen a mid-game, uh, you know, contract extension, especially in a playoff series like that. I was, I was not expecting that at all. Yeah, I mean, when I saw the email, I was like, these aren't the intermission notes. What are you doing? Uh, I, I was just so baffled by that coming when it did. Um, but so we talk about Halak. Uh, how about this guy? Uh, comes in after... Start starts a game three. Uh, at the time, I mean, we recorded a video, you and I, about Rask opting out literally like an hour after this all happened, that day before game three. And there was a feeling, and I know you felt it too, there was not a real reason to be confident in the Bruins at that point. You know, maybe they'd rally around. To, maybe. That was not the forefront of people's minds. It was the Bruins just lost their number one starting Vesna caliber goalie. And they have a lot going out there who didn't look great in the round robin, uh, who, you know, Hadn't been in the postseason since 2015, and he's 4-0. His save percentage is 930. Again, this is of the four games he's played, not including the round robin game, because as Brad Marchand tells us, don't include those games. Those are exhibition games. And you know what? As he's talked more and said this, I think he has a point. I think he actually – they're backing up their word on that. I was so ready for them to get swept in the first round and to go, hey, you didn't work hard enough in the round robin, and now that's worked. But having Halak back there, playing the way he is. Does this give you confidence that, that he's going to be their guy? You know, he can really take this team on a deep run and potentially be their starting goalie next year? Yeah, I mean, I think just for, you know, looking at the now in terms of this postseason, I mean, I think for the Bruins, you know, I think whoever they were going to put in that, they were going to rally around, you know, just the way that kind of locker room operates and how they can rally around different guys in certain situations. But I think from the players' perspective, too, you look at it in terms of who you have back there. It's not like... Again, it was D 
Dan Vladar, who hasn't appeared in a game, and all of a sudden he's like your go-to guy. Or it's not like a situation the like Def Con, yeah, DefCon Ten, you know, where you have like a situation like that. Like you lose, you lose uh, Rask, um, you know, which is a, a tough hit for the team, but you still have a guy who's arguably been the best you one B in the league the last two years since they've had him. He's still like a very, very good goaltender. He's not as good as Tuka Rask, but um, can still win you plenty of games, especially when you have the rest of the team playing it the way it is now where, you know, they have a structured defensive stru- uh, defense in front of them. They're you know, executing on special teams. The penalty kills looked good so far. Like they're doing things to help him out, but it's not like, you know, they're kind of, you know, winning in spite of him. It was, you know, th- that game four against Carolina, you could probably make the case there, but, where, I mean, he led in just a couple of soft goals there. But, I mean, you looked in that second period uh, in game one against Tampa, where, I mean, that's kind of the Tampa we're used to seeing, where they're just peppering in shots from great A ice. And he, he stood tall. I mean, that, that save on Goudreau was great. So, I think, you know, he has the talent. He has the, you know, the, the moxie, the, you know, what a, a veteran goalie has to kind of lead you on a run. So, going to next year, who knows? I, I still imagine – you saw people talk about the Vladar extension. It's like, oh, is this a sign of he's going to be their backup next year? It's like, I think, again, you don't want to look too far into the future, but I think the game plan is still you roll back with Rask and Halak and you let Vladar and Swayman fight for that number one spot down in Providence. You know, this is a team that has built kind of the roster it has the last two years off of, you know, get that internal competition. I think what better – way to do that down in Providence and have those two guys go at it. And that seems like an ideal situation for them down in the AHL. Yeah. And I also think this is the best year the Bruins could have had this goaltending thing happen with Rask. I mean, you think back in past years, Hudobin, when he was here in 2016, 17, I don't think had a win until like December. And then he was great in 2017, 18. Now he's leading the stars uh, through the postseason. What a weird year this has been. If you guys had no idea, 2020 is a little bit off. Um, and uh, but if you think of any other year, you know, if you think they had like Nicholas Fedberg back there or uh, who were such Chad Johnson. They probably would have like won a cup with Chad Johnson. Chad Johnson was nasty that year. Okay. All right. Fine. 2013-14, <laughs> they win the cup because of Chad Johnson, not because of Tuka Rask. I like that take. That is a nice hot steaming take for this Monday afternoon. But it is fascinating to me how this Halak thing has panned out and how well he's looked. But again, and I said this on a video last night, there's still that potential to lay a dud. I mean, you look back at, at last year's postseason, and again, this comes with Halak. It, it, it happens. You know, he's a 1B, he's older, stuff like that. But last year, Rask was never at, I didn't feel he was ever at fault for any of their losses. If you, I don't think there was a game, except for game seven of the cup, that, uh, that, that you could look at Rask and say, it's the reason the Bruins lost was because of Tuka Rask. Game four, if they lost, it would have been because of Halak. Um, but they didn't, they won. But I, do, I am waiting for that game to happen against Tampa Bay because they're the Lightning and he's Halak. And I feel like at some point, there's going to be that moment, as you said, where he lays a dud and they lose. And then you're going to get the questions of, does he have the potential? Can he carry this team? And is Ladar Lada- is the guy doesn't put in there? Which I think is not the right thing to ask, but I think people are going to say it. Yeah, I mean, I think even look, I think Halak can also have a good game, and he could still let in three goals with this Tampa team playing the way it could be playing. I mean, again, this team was dreadful in that opening twenty minutes, and even for a good chunk of that that third period, the Bruins were doing a good job of keeping them to the outside. It really, wasn't until late when, again, Hedman's just bouncing pucks off McAvoy if they're getting that offense going there. But um, you know, even you, I think you're going to see a lot more pushback anyway. So. I think you still need Halak to just be fantastic in the whole series regardless. Cause I still think, you know, if you finish with two, three goals allowed and you win four, three, I think that's a good, that's what you got to do to get past this team. Cause I mean, this, again, this team's scary, man. Like that team can beat you in a whole bunch of ways. And yeah, you saw her and you know, it's, it was two years ago and it's two very different teams, especially from the Bruins perspective now, but Bruins looked really good in that game one against them in the second round of 2018 and they just got shellacked. What did Rick Nash have two goals in that game one, if I remember correctly? They looked good in that game one. I think the the top line, you know, had a a bunch of points. Like, they they looked pretty good. I remember seeing that game and being like, oh, my God, the Bruins are really about to make a legitimate Stanley Cup run. And then the next four games, I don't even – like, they could barely get any sustained offensive zone time. They get that Um, that McAvoy penalty, which, you know, I think they still remember about. That was a a tough break for them, and that was kind of put them down 3-0 hole – 3-1 hole, rather, and – and the rest was history there. Yeah, that was a uh, a tough series. But it's a different Bruins team. But also the Lightning are better 
The Lightning are, this is the thing with the Lightning. I'll put it so simply. The Lightning are a much better team on paper than the Bruins. And that's hard to do. That's not easy. The Bruins are a great team on paper. Marshawn said last night, three number one centers. Charlie Coyle is your number one center now. How does it feel? Uh, but no, but the crazy part is they are so deep. And they're deep on defense. They're deep up front. That third line, I'm telling you, this is my little, little take here. Goudreau and Coleman, adding them to the third line is sort of like what the Bruins did in 2011 with Chris Kelly and Rich Peverly. Doesn't that give you a little bit of the same vibe? Oh, Never I mean, know. Dude, that team, that, that line is nasty. Like, people yeah. talk about just, like, adding, like, you know, guys who are going to be more chippy and stuff like that. And it's not like they're, like, Pat Maroon, you know, and they're not going to be, like, beating the bag out of guys. But, like, so those, uh, that, that, yeah, that goes, those guys after every whistle are getting involved. But, like, when you saw again that Columbus series, man, they were killing them on the floor check. That, that line is good. And that's the thing. So that's why this Tampa team scares everyone. And that's also why I think this is the Eastern Conference final in some sense. Uh, obviously, the Flyers are great with Kata Hot and Net. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that series, either of those teams could maybe go to the Cup. But as we, we all said it back during the year, the two best teams in the East, Tampa and Boston. And what sucks is the old playoff format, or the normal one, made them meet in the second round. This year, they do a whole different format. They still meet in the second round. But I look at these teams, and I say, you win this series. In my opinion, you win the Cup. And here's why. If you're Boston, to get past Tampa Bay, in my opinion, the best team in hockey. They, they are. I know the points don't show it, but they are a better team than you are. Um, and they're better than everybody else. Getting past them in the second round, you've basically proven to people we can beat the best team. Now, they didn't, the Bruins didn't have that moment last postseason. The best team they faced was the Blues, and they lost. Uh, <laughs> they lost that series. But with this, the Lightning team, you're facing the best possible team in the second round. And now after the Lightning, you beat the Bruins, who are the second best team in the East, in my opinion, and you're also still the best team. So to me, I wonder if you see this the same way. I look at this as Eastern Conference Final. What do you look at this as? Uh, I mean, I kind of look at it just, I think maybe last year it's kind of spooked me a little bit in terms of, you know, looking ahead. Because I thought once they got past, you know, they, they take care of Carolina. I thought they were going to just smoke St. Louis. I was like so unimpressed with St. Louis. And they played their style of game and just limited them. And I think you look at, you know, let's say they get past Tampa, you know, Philly, if Philly's the one that moves on, like we saw last year, what happens when you go against uh, uh, a young, talented goaltender on a hot streak, what can happen? And Philly, what impresses me about them, and even though, you know, they went, this series went a little bit longer than probably people were expecting against Montreal, like that's still a team that can, you know, score in bunches on you, but also like they played a lot of really tight one goal games and they can really pack it in pretty well. Um, so, I mean, that's a team that I think is still going to give you problems. And then, Congrats, you know, you get past, you know, a good Philly team. You get past uh, a loaded Tampa Bay team. Uh, Vegas is obliterating teams right now. Like, oh, my God. I think, I think Vancouver's a, a very fun team. They're a little bit soft defensively, and uh, Vegas put them on the ropes that entire game. And, again, we'll see what happens with Colorado um, with the amount of injuries they've had, which is a tough break for them. But, like, that's a team you look at those matchups. If they got to a, a cup final against the Bruins, you're like, all right, well, who's going to be – who's covering Nathan McKinnon, who's covering kind of the waves they attack you with, who's covering your boy, Kale McCall, like that. There's, there's a whole bunch of uh, different matchups that, you know, that could cause problems for the Bruins. So I think it's just kind of taking that one step at a time. And again, on paper, the Tampa Bay is probably the biggest test you're going to face. But again, Tampa, you kind of have the book out on them. You at least know the matchups you can kind of exploit to, to get past them. You go against a team like Colorado or Vegas, where it's a team out west, you still have to do a whole new game plan. Those guys are very aggressive. They're fast. Um, it's a whole new kind of different way to approach it. So I think mean, it's definitely kind of one step at a time. But, um, you know, I don't think this Tampa series is going to be ending anytime soon, though. I don't either. And, and that was my next thing is uh, this series is not just hype. And I think a lot of some people might think it is. Some people might think we're saying it is just to kind of generate hype around it. This is legit. Like, this series should go seven games. I don't see how it doesn't. Um, I, my thing is, I think it's – my prediction for this series was Bruins in seven. Now, the reason I keep picking the Bruins is because I picked them to win the Cup back – or to go to the Cup in March. And I'm dying on that hill. That is the hill I'm dying on. Every player on that team could get an injury, and they could be literally starting the Providence Bruins. And I would still be like, hey, Bruins in seven. <laughs> Bruins in eight. But I, I think this series – 
has a chance to be one of the most exciting and best playoff series we've seen in recent memory, not just with the Bruins, but with the hockey in general. I mean, you think back to like Chicago and LA and those Pittsburgh and Montreal series, and even the Boston Montreal series. This, I think this goes right up there with those if it goes how we plan it goes. Yeah, I mean, there's already got, I mean, the talent on both teams is incredible. They've, you know, both got a lot of bad blood that you start to already start to brew in game one. You know, it's just going to get worse and worse as the series goes on. So, and especially I think you look at game two, the way how flat Tampa looked. I think, you know, John Cooper even said today they want to play them a lot more physically. So I think you're going to see, I remember that game against Montreal in December where the teams were really going after um Poster knock in that game. That's a game where he, he not launched that missile against Carey Price, but he was, knocked, he was knocked around that whole game, though. Like, I think you're going to see a lot more of that, a lot more scrums breaking out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this is definitely a series that's going to go the distance. Like, the, the only thing that I could see changing the course of the series, you know, more in Boston's favor um, would be just if the way the special teams are looking kind of hold out. Like, Tampa, I think, is 0 for 13 since the actual playoff started. So, that's a team that seems like it's too good to be stuck in a slump like that. But Boston's PK is also pretty good. So, you know, they've done a good job so far. And, um, you know, if that new power play the Bruins have with David Krejci added to that group, if that continues to find success, then that can change some things. But, you know, um, and then also you look at maybe injuries wise. I mean, if Steven Stamkos comes back in game five or something, that's a big hit, but also you don't really know what's up with Ryan McDonough. Ryan McDonough left that game. If you lose him, man, like he's like, Victor Hedman gets all the, uh, you know, applause, and rightfully so. Victor Hedman's a top th- three, four defenseman. But, like, in terms of, like, shutdown option, like, Ryan McDonough's a shutdown guy. You lose him, like, that's that's a brutal hit for them. So, a couple of different factors that you, have that, you know, play into it. But I still think this series, like, the way these teams are matched up, like, it'd be almost a shame. I wouldn't – it feels weird saying it'd be a shame if it didn't go six or seven. I think Bruins fans would love it if it went five or six and they move on. But, like, you just look at the way this series is. I can't see it going, you know, anything shorter than, you know, seven games. And that's the thing. And, and you mentioned that power play, by the way, with Krejci on it. What a difference. I mean, they've always kept Krejci on the second unit, kind of to jumpstart that and be able to carry the puck up ice for that unit. But holy crap. I mean, you put David Krejci, David Pasternak, Brad Marchand, Patrice Bergeron, and Tori Krug on the ice together. And go figure. That power play starts to uh, generate some chances there. Um, and it, it's incredible. I mean, what David Krejci especially has been able to do. And um, Cassidy was asked also today about playoff Pasternak. Playoff Pasternak's also been great. Uh, I think it was at 49 points in 48 career playoff games. Or I, think so, yeah. I think it's that stat. Uh, Krejci's seven straight postseason games with a point. Marshawn's firing. Bergeron's firing. Goes to show. And it sounds cliche. When your top guys produce, typically good things happen. And that's pretty much been their MO. I mean, the top line was incredible against Carolina. And also, I mean, you know, this didn't really get talked about a lot between us, but, you know, the fact that they stepped up the way they did against Carolina, the fact that with David Pasternak down, with Rask out, you know, you have guys like Marshawn, Bergeron, Krejci um, producing. Pasternak was back in the lineup. He's been producing. So to me, I mean, and then the other thing is I'm not really worried about, or it's not that I'm not worried about, but Pasternak's nagging injury he had doesn't seem to have reared its head again. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't be surprised to see it kind of come back if Tampa continues to be more physical on him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think you look at even in, in that game, you know, that that game one, the Bruins could have had, you know, four goals in the first two periods. I mean, Andre Kosh needs to like, you know, oh my like, God. Burn, burn his sticks or like make like, you know, do like a blood sacrifice or something. Sell dude, his soul to the but, devil. To I mean, goal. like I, you have to be at least encouraged because, you know, the chances are getting or if you've got that, you know, years ago, if you got that last year, you would probably win the cup, right? If you had a guy like him on that line with Krejci, but um, so they're at least generating looks. I think Jake DeBrusco has been really engaged and really effective since that two goal game in game four. So I think you have to be just encouraged the way they're all playing. And then the fourth line, which I think is going to be crucial in this series, not just, you know, in terms of they've shown a lot of energy, but they've had a lot of success over the years going up against a guy like Kucherov. For some reason, Kucherov, I mean, I think you've seen in other playoff series, but that dude just will like lose his mind at some point during these playoffs. And I think especially once Bruins get last change and you have Cassidy ideally matching up, you know, that point line against Corrali and those guys, I think those guys can be huge in terms of kind of limiting kind of Tampa's big guns up there. He's Kucherov's kryptonite. That's what he is. And what's crazy is, and, and I think this is legit to ask after game one, even though it's been one game, are the lightning frustrated? 
You see Kalorn take that interference penalty on McAvoy. The puck's not even near him. Like, little things like that you see. You see Kucherov, you know, start arguing with the ref after Charles, a little tough on him in the corner. Like, this Tampa team is – they're big and physical, but mentally they are soft. And I think you started to see that in game one. This continues. You're going to see that a lot more in games two, three, and the rest of the series because this is a team that's frustrated with how last year went. They're frustrated that they put up 37 shots on a backup goalie and only scored two goals. They're both from the point. I mean, there's a lot of little things here they're going to start getting frustrated about, especially if those pucks do not start going in the net. So that is going to be something we have to watch. And I would not be surprised to see this that affect uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning. What is your prediction for this series? I had Bruins in seven. I said that uh, they were going to score a, a third period power play goal after Kucherov lost his mind and did like a really poor time, like cross checking uh, penalty. That was going to be my prediction for how the series was going to go. But I had Bruins in seven going into it. Mine will be that ending. But then Nick Ritchie trips a guy on the way by, goes to the box, the Lightning score on the power play, they tie it late, and then. We'll say Joaquin Nordstrom wins it in overtime. There it's we go. It's going to be Kasha. Kasha, like, has to score. Like, I've seen enough sports movies to know that Andre Kasha has to score at least one overtime goal in this postseason before it all ends because that dude, the amount of chances he's had, it's just absurd. Yeah, and the funny thing is we all said that about DeBrusque after he missed those open nets early in the Carolina series. Then he scores two goals. You have to think, does Kasha score by the end of this series? I say yes. Yeah. Yes. The, 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 the chances he got in that game one, I, like, I don't know how you don't bury at least one of those going forward. And again, if it was against, you know, uh, Mrazek or, or Rhyme or some of the looks he had in that game, it's probably a little bit of a different story. But, I mean, Vasilevsky's good for a reason, right? Like, I mean, that guy's legit. So, a little bit of a different, uh, you know, departure in that when you compare him to what Carolina had. Well, that breakaway that Kasha had that Vasilevsky just extended the pad for, I mean, my goodness, what a yeah. save. And just yeah. how pissed you would be if you're under Kasha. Connor, I want to say thank you for coming on. Uh, before you go, what are you working on at BSJ right now that people should go uh, subscribe to for? Yeah, a whole bunch of stuff, as you said kind of earlier. I mean, there's so much things coming out every single day. So we got a couple of breakdowns, the usual stuff. We got our, our weekly, uh, you know, mailbox where we answer questions. And I've got a couple of features I'm working on. You, you got to find kind of that, that time in between games. It's tough when you got back-to-backs almost every other day to, to crank out some of these things. But get a lot of stuff we're working on here that we're pretty excited to roll out hopefully as this postseason goes goes forward. So, you know, subscribe to Boston Sports Journal and you can follow me on Twitter at Connor Ryan underscore 93. Do all that. Go follow for that. Uh, and for CLS Media, I'm Evan Marinovsky. You Bruins Beat listeners, have a great rest of your week.